how does the brain forget and how and why does it remember? So maybe some of the mechanisms. You mentioned the hippocampus. What are the different components involved here? So we can think about this on a number of levels. Maybe I'll give you the simplest version first, which is we tend to think of memories as these individual things and we can just access them maybe a little bit like, you know, photos on your phone or something like that. But in the brain, the way it works is you have this distributed pool of neurons and the memories are kind of shared across different pools of neurons. And so what you have is competition where sometimes memories that overlap can be fighting against each other, right? So sometimes we forget because that competition just wipes things out. Sometimes we forget because there aren't the biological signals which we can get into that would promote long-term retention. And lots of times we forget because we can't find the cue that sends us back to the right memory. Mm -hmm. And we need the right cue to be able to activate it, right? So, um, you know, for instance, in a neural network, there is no, you wouldn't go and you'd say, this is the memory, right? It's like the whole network, I mean, the whole ecosystem of memories is in the weights of the neural network. And in fact, you could extract entirely new memories depending on how you feed. Yeah, you have you to know. have the right query, the right prompt to access that, whatever the part you're looking for. That's exactly right, that's exactly right. And in humans, you have this more complex set of ways memory works. There's, as I said, the knowledge or what you call semantic memory. And then there's these memories for specific events, which we call episodic memory. And so there's different pieces of the puzzle that require different kinds of cues. So that's a big part of it too, is just this kind of what we call retrieval failure. You mentioned episodic memory, you mentioned semantic memory. What are the different separations here? What's uh, working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory? What are the interesting categories of memory? Yeah, and so memory researchers, we love to cut things up and mm -hmm. say, you know, it, is memory one thing or is it two things? Or is it two things or is it three things? And so one of the things that there's value in that, and especially experimental value in terms of being able to dissect things, in the real world, it's all connected. Speak to your question, working memory is a term that was coined by Alan Baddeley. It's basically thought to be this ability to keep information online in your mind right in front of you at a given time, and to be able to control the flow of that information, to choose what information is relevant, to be able to manipulate it, and so forth. And one of the things that Alan did that was quite brilliant was he said, there's this ability to kind of passively store information, you know, see things in your mind's eye or hear your internal monologue. But, um, you know, we have that ability to keep information in mind. But then we also have this separate, what he called an, uh, a central executive, which is identified a lot with the prefrontal cortex. It's this ability to control the flow of information that's being kept active based on what it is you're doing. Now, a lot of my early work was basically saying that this working memory, which some memory researchers would call short-term memory, is not at all independent from long-term memory. That is that a lot of executive function requires learning and you have to have like synaptic change for that to happen. And um, But there's also transient forms of memory. So one of the things I've been getting into lately is the idea that we form internal models of events. The obvious one that I always use is birthday parties, right? So you go to a child's birthday party. Once the cake comes out and they start, you just see a candle, you can predict the whole frame, you know, set of events that happens later. And up till that point where the child blows out the candle, you have an internal model in your head of what's going on. And so if you follow people's eyes, it's not actually on what's happening. It's going where the action's about to happen, um, which is just fascinating, right? So you have this internal model, and that's a kind of a working memory product. It's something that you're keeping online that's allowing you to interpret this world around you. Now, to build that model, though, you need to pull out stuff from uh, your general knowledge of the world, which is what we call semantic memory. And then you'd want to be able to pull out memories for specific events that happened in the past, which we call episodic memory. So in a way, they're all connected, even though it's different. Um, the things that we're focusing on and the way we organize information in the present, which is working memory, will play a big role in determining how we remember that information later, which people typically call long-term memory. So if you have something like a birthday party and you've been to many before, you're gonna load that from disk into working memory, this model, and then you're mostly operating on the model. 
And if it's a new task, you're, you don't have a model. So you're more in the data collection. Yes. One of the fascinating things that we've been studying, and this is, we're not at all the first to do this. Um, Jeff Sachs was a big pioneer in this. Um, and I've been working with many other people, Ken Norman, um, Leila Devachi at NY, or at Columbia has done some interesting stuff with this, is this idea that we form these internal models at particular points of high prediction error or points of, I believe, also points of uncertainty, points of surprise or motivationally significant periods. And those points are when it's maximally optimal to encode an episodic memory. So I used to think, oh, well, we're just encoding episodic memories constantly, boom, 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 boom. But think about how much redundancy there is in all that, right? It's just a lot of information that you don't need. But if you capture an episodic memory at the point of maximum uncertainty for the singular experience, right? You're just, it's only going to happen once. But if you capture it at the point of maximum uncertainty or maximum surprise, you have the most useful point in your experience that you've grabbed. And what we see is that the hippocampus and these other networks uh, that are involved in generating these internal models of events, they show a heightened period of connectivity or correlated activity during those breaks between different events, which we call event boundaries. These are the points where you're like surprised or you cross from one room to another and so forth. And that communication is associated with a bump of activity in the hippocampus and better memory. And so if people have a very good internal model, Throughout that event, you don't need to do much memory processing. You're in a predictive mode, right? And so then at these event boundaries, you encode, and then you retrieve, and you're like, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here? Ranganath's now talking about orcas. What's going on? And maybe you have to go back and remember reading my book to pull out the episodic memory to make sense of whatever it is I'm babbling about, right? And so there's this beautiful dynamics that you can see in the brain of these different networks that are coming together and then de-affiliating at different points in time that are allowing you to go into these modes. And so to speak to your original question, mm -hmm. to some extent, when we're talking about semantic memory and episodic memory and working memory, you can think about it as these processes that are unfolding as these networks kind of come together and pull apart.